When I was a college student here in Erie, I spent a summer working at a sailing and boating program for inner city youth. I learned a lot that summer about how to work with kids, but I also learned how to stand up paddleboard. Now typically a stand up paddleboard is used on calm, flat water like a bay, but I had a theory that on a stormy day, I could probably surf the thing on Lake Erie. So the next time a storm rolled into town, I headed down to Prescott State Park to scope out the area. And sure enough, in Erie, Pennsylvania, in Prescott State Park, I found a guy unloading a surfboard from his car. Not a stand-up paddleboard, like the weird second cousin of the surfboard, but a legitimate surfboard. So it turns out that Great Lakes surfing is far more than the pipe dream of some random guy here in Erie. There are clubs all across the Great Lakes, from Rochester, New York, to Duluth, Minnesota, with dozens, even hundreds of members in each. I was lucky enough to meet a few of the Erie area surfers during one of my first sessions as a wannabe Great Lakes surfer and learned a lot from these guys in a very short period of time. They taught me about the water and the waves. Turns out that our waves here in the lakes are typically smaller than those ridden on the ocean. They can also be choppy and shapeless. Guys call it washing machine style. But there's one primary way that our waves in the Great Lakes differ from those found on the ocean. There are no tides on the Great Lakes. Thus, all waves are the product of very high winds. So when do you find high winds in Erie, Pennsylvania? Easy, every single day. No, when do you find the highest winds in Erie, Pennsylvania? Or really anywhere along the Great Lakes, for that matter? You find them as cold fronts roll in. You find them before and after storms. And you find them at the change of seasons. You see, Great Lakes surfing is a fall and winter sport. All along the northernmost borders of New York and Pennsylvania, Ohio and Michigan, Indiana and Illinois, Wisconsin and Minnesota, people choose to venture into the Great Lakes during September, October, November, December, and January, clear until the water freezes each year in order to surf. Wearing wetsuits that are basically as thick as those pink insulation squares you buy at Home Depot, uh, with dozens of theories on how to stay warm, with beards full of ice, waves are ridden all across the Great Lakes. There we go. Waves are ridden all across the Great Lakes. I want to make sure you guys got a, a look at that guy. That's real. Um, waves are ridden all across the Great Lakes. In case you're wondering, the water in this part of the country during late fall and early winter is in fact frigid. Not chilly, not like, uh, oh, it's Memorial Day, I don't think I'm ready to hop in the pool just yet, but frigid. Like bobbing chunks of ice in the water where you're surfing, type cold. Like brain freeze upon submersion, type cold. Like get to know the warning signs of hypothermia, type cold. <laughs> Still yet, these guys venture out time and time again, feeling that same stoke that a native might feel on a great day at their home break on Maui. So I also learned a lot from these guys and their optimism. To leave the 37 degree water with a beard wrapped in ice and your lips wrapped in a smile meant something. These guys scoff at their geography, their rationality, their desire for warmth. In fact, by waiting for the fall and winter weather to arrive, these guys essentially create their own waves. Now, this idea of creating one's own wave seemed familiar to me. My grandfather is an Italian immigrant. He's now 98 years old and lives in Greenville, Pennsylvania, where he settled after passing through Ellis Island. Greenville is a prime example of a Rust Belt town. In the 1970s and 1980s, we had manufacturing and industry, which equated to employment and stability. But now we struggle to find our big opportunity, which equates to despair. And in so many cases, a flight from this part of the country. But when my grandpa planned to come here in 1930, he had envisioned a very glamorous, almost ritzy sort of America. Reaching our shores in 1930, he found a very different nation. No one dreamed of stepping into the Great Depression. Looking back on the reality he thought he'd find and the reality that he discovered, my grandpa said, they told us the streets in America would be paved with gold. 
we got here and they weren't paved at all. And it was actually our job to pave them. Well, this doesn't sound very fun. He described this as the American dream. So armed with a sixth grade education and a gritty mentality, my grandpa opened a barber shop, then a convenience store, then a restaurant, then a motel. Much like the Great Lakes surfers, he refused to be imprisoned by the conditions around him. Now, my father took over the restaurant and motel at 18 and owned them both for 30 years. Today, he still owns the motel. So how do you feed a family by running a small motel in an even smaller Rust Belt town that most people don't want to visit? Refusal to be imprisoned by the conditions. So when I finished college, I took a job at my high school alma mater. I called my former soccer coach, my biggest role model, to share the news. I said to him, coach, guess what? I'm coming back to the school to work. His response was dry and sarcastic, but told a sad and significant truth. Oh, you're coming home? That's an interesting idea, Nick. A young person comes back to the area to work. Now, if you're a young professional in this part of the country, maybe someone who's chosen to further your education in this part of the country, I'm sure you've heard the speech. Maybe you've even heard the version that's established or adapted for established professionals. The speech goes something like this. Quote, you're so talented. You have so much potential. Go somewhere where it can be put to good use. Go west, go south. Heck, go overseas. Just go somewhere. I don't know. I would just hate to see you be wasted. Here. Wasted here. For seeing something that you think is worth developing here, you're wasting something. In fact, when you tell people that you choose to live and work in this part of the country, a lot of times they just look at you like you're nuts. Like you just made the most ridiculous and impossible claim. Like you said to them something so absurd. Like you surf on Lake Superior in December or something, which clearly we all know is impossible. In 1981, sociologist Joel Garreau published a book called The Nine Nations of North America. His premise in the book was simple. Yes, we have 50 states here in the U.S., but perhaps the tragedies and triumphs that we share regionally are actually more significant than state lines. So in his book, Garreau proposes nine nations. I wasn't born when the book was written, but most of his analysis seems reasonable based upon the America that I know. For example, he says that Southern Florida is its own nation. He calls it the islands. The Pacific Northwest, he calls it ecotopia. But one of the nine nations puzzled me when I first read the book. That is our own nation, the one that we so often call the Rust Belt. See, in the 1970s and 1980s, when Garreau did his research, this area was still best known for building things. We built cars, we built trains, steel, and more. So the dusty shadow of America that I've only ever known as the Rust Belt, according to Garreau, was once perhaps better described as the foundry. The foundry. The place we now know as the Rust Belt was once better described as the foundry, a place where objects are molded and forged and built. People built things here in Erie, in Meadville, in Ashtabula, in Cleveland, in Gary, Indiana, in Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, and that process of building things ultimately built up the people. But before people built things here, they built ideas. And in order to build these ideas, they took risks, they made sacrifices, and they committed to being right here, to work, but also to live, and to love, and to learn. If you can look at the waves of Lake Erie in December and feel the stoke, if you can get barreled outside Buffalo, If you can catch a right in Cleveland, then maybe you can see something or share something or build something in the same locations, no matter how impossible the conditions may seem. So can we do it? Can we look at the remains of a Rust Belt America? Crumbling buildings, crumbling machinery, crumbling demographics, crumbling optimism, and see something worth salvaging if we can learn to do this, I know that someday 
they'll tell the story of this region again. It'll sound something like this. These people, the doers and the thinkers, the readers and the writers, the educators and the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the visionaries, and yes, the surfers of the Rust Belt, with their backs against the wall, with their resources limited, with the doubters all around them, they opened their heart and their minds and created, never once allowing themselves to be imprisoned by the conditions around them. Create your own wave. Thank you very much.